everyone. Welcome. Um, I want to welcome all of you from all over. And I want to also talk about this particular conversation today. It's uh, not meant to be a panel. It's not an interview. Just so you're, you're familiar with the format. What we're trying and what we're aiming for is an authentic conversation between two people, two people who we felt have a lot in common, two people who work with art and artists, um, who work with communities, who bring people into relationship with one another so that they can find solutions um, to their own challenges. And again, within the context of what's going on in the world today, you can't have a conversation that isn't affected uh, by what's going on in the world and what's going on in your own life. So that means also all of us here in this conversation. So what I hope happens is that a conversation starts to take place between Marlene and Mosin after we, uh, I, I'll, ask, I'll start it off with a question. But before I do that, what I'd like to do is introduce to you uh, Mosin Moedin and Marlene LaRue. Marlene, um, I know that how you feel today is strongly affected by something that has happened just today in your life. And um, I'd like you to, to um, you know, I, I think Zina, you have a slide that we can see and then Marlene, perhaps you can begin. I just want to say thank you that I could be on this forum. And because we're going to talk about humanity, Kevin Fortain was sadly stabbed to death one of my young people that I mentored through these years, a wonderful world-renowned dancer, talented person, and it was for humanity. And this talk for me today, it's about his memory. Thank you. Uh, Mosin uh, and uh, Marlene, I'm going to, um, you know, start with you, uh, Mosin, and and the question is for both of you, and it's to get, and, and I think for you to share with one another, you know, we'd like, we'd like to know where you are today. We'd like to know the path that has led to where you are today um, in terms of the work that you do with communities and what you're about. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, really honored to be here, honored to be in the same company as Marlene. Uh, rest in power to Kirvan. Um, that's a great way to start. Uh, we'll keep him in mind. Um, so my name is uh, Mosin Mohideen. I'm the founder of MeWe International. Um, I'm a survivor of war and violence and a survivor of sexual abuse. Um, and these imposed narratives on my life risked arresting the development of my life. And it was through the arts that I found uh, methods and tangible ways to liberate the stories inside of me, to transform my pain instead, instead of transmit it. Um, so my organization and, and, and what we do comes from a very personal space. Um, what started with one camera and, and 20, Syrian Refugees in a Refugee Camp is today a global organization that has reached more than 3,000 people across five countries, Jordan, Turkey, uh, Lebanon, Germany, Honduras, Mexico. We're scaling in the United States. Um, you know, I, I'm, we're talking right now as uh, there is an intense um, search happening in the United States of America and I would argue in the world with COVID and then in the United States right now with uh, the racial unrest and discrimination that's taking place. Um, art, the arts right now is the, is the one thing that can help us transform the pain that we're all going through instead of transmitting it to the next generation. Uh, I firmly believe that. Um, you know, 
60 to 70,000 years ago when our earlier species created language, you know, the core of language started with symbols. And symbols is, you know, the manifestation of art, of giving meaning to things that seemingly were meaningless. Um, and through the evolution of language, we realized that we could invent culture and we could not be uh, uh, slaves to biology, uh, but actually uh, masters of our bodies and our minds and actually transform everything around us through the arts. Um, the work that we do and, and what I firmly believe, which is relevant to today's conversation, is that the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves shapes how we treat ourselves. And how we treat ourselves influences how we engage with the people on the planet around us. And for me, my method or my medium is language, is words, is narratives. Um, that's kind of my artistic medium. And every single person has the power and ability and the human right to be an architect and an artist of the narrative of their own lives. We are not passive consumers to the social systems uh, and the external narratives imposed upon us without our permission. We all, whether you're an artist or not an artist, we all are artists. We all are active architects uh, in the narrative of our lives. And yet, with the advent of language and communications came the advent of systems of competition and subjugation or cooperation and harmony. And this is the binary power of stories and language that we see playing out right now. And as language and, and words and, and the arts evolved, it suddenly became a tool where those that could command language to control information uh, and, and influence decision-making, that turned into competition to subjugate others and silence others. And we see today that stories are being weaponized to subjugate and silence and maintain the status quo systems of inequality. What drives me and why I'm honored to be, you know, with, with connected to you all on this call and especially with Marlene and her work is that we must combat the inequality and narratives that persist in the world. It is these inequality and narratives and stories that enables these socioeconomic and human rights inequalities to persist today. And as I speak about this, let me first say the names of those that are resting in power, George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, those brothers and sisters who lost their lives as a result of these inequalities. And if you look at the protests and demonstrations today, what are people doing? They're singing, mm. they're drawing, they're making posters, they're making videos. And what are the systems trying to do? And what do all systems try and do? to control the power of the people, right? ISIS, when they invaded certain areas, went first for the monuments and for the arts. Mm -hmm. I myself have worked with survivors of ISIS in Mosul who were tortured by ISIS for listening to music, for painting, for having earphones in their ears. Mm -hmm. During slavery in the United States, it was illegal for Africans to gather to educate and learn how to read and write. Why? Because everybody knows the power that comes from creative expression, the power that comes from being able to connect your mind and your heart with your breath. And yeah. then through the arts, transferring that power to give shape and form to things that can transform the world. And that, um, you know, relates to, to how Ulrika was talking earlier about the story. Um, and, and who controls the story. I think that that um, is, is a great place to start and for, uh, for me to invite you, Marlene, to talk about your path and, and how it relates to that. But I also wanted to say that it seems to me that uh, Kiran is at part of that list that Mohsen just gave of, of examples of people who their lives were cut short in a tragic way um because of narratives because of differences that uh, couldn't be resolved uh, or weren't resolved in a dialogic way in a conversational way 
So Marlene, welcome. I first want to hug Hussain um, and to say thank you for the work that you are doing because it's courageous work. It is, um, it is sometimes unthankful work and it's a lonely path. It's not easy. And I think I would like to recognize that first. Thank you for keeping it up because it's not easy. I want to say thank you to the museum that you saying that you're a museum without walls because it's very important because we're putting up walls in so many ways and structures, which is invisible, but it's actually the feeling of visibility. So I want to say to the museum for taking the uncomfortable path to open yourself to these conversations, because these conversations is not easy conversations, and it's uncomfortable conversations as well. So thank you to Ulrike, the director, and thank you to, the, uh, to Henry, who's steering this museum. So it's, it's extremely important that we need to, to say thank you. My, my path in particular, and for everybody that is listening today, it is much more a humble path. And it is, I always say I'm a survivor of apartheid because apartheid was brutal. I come from slavery. I'm a woman of color. I'm 53 years old. I contracted polio when I was three months old. My, my ancestors, my granny was a farm worker and it was brutality. We were denied every, everything that you can think of and you were invisible. But what was the, if I can remember very much from my early age and I want to share it because we're talking about telling stories is how you can also change your own narrative to say, how am I going to take my narrative to influence positivity in a way that you can steer people or you can become a victim of your own past and you can't then play a meaningful role and steering young people, especially young people where we are now in a direction of forgiveness but you can't forgive if you don't know your identity and where you come from and one of the first things that i have learned of becoming i contracted polio but also in a very loving community that had absolutely zero nothing what they had was music what they brought with them from the slavery ancestry was music, was the stories, and telling each other stories, singing, drama, all of that. So with apartheid, I think everybody knows on this platform what apartheid was. You've experienced, I've experienced from a very young age, what it is to see a very noble person, which was my granny, I'm one of 11, and my mother, who has been diminished to nothing when they went to go and work in white people's houses or to pick the wonderful grapes that people now drink as wine. I'm just making an example. But when they come home, they're these wonderful, respectful persons. And you then realize how from a young age I realized how you need to navigate. I then became a political activist, but my singing was always grounded. And faith was not used to segregate people. Faith was used to bring people together. So why I say from the beginning, I will say to you, I am so blessed to grow up poor, to grow up with nothing, without wealth, to grow up to know what it is to be invisible, 
to know what it is to be discriminated against so that I can know I must really not do this to anybody else. And that you need to be conscious. You must make a conscious decision not to do it. So every day in my life, even in my adulthood, I make a conscious decision every single day because apartheid didn't vanish when we in 1994 voted for the first time because apartheid was successfully instituted because it was a mindset and it was in the minds of people and it was stories of fear that was instilled in the other person to feel that if you the other you must fear the other and that narrative and that is when i want to come to the work where i am am now why i see the arts play such a vital role because i'm the first woman and i didn't want it the job because i see myself more as a facilitator i was the first in my family and in my street, in and in my community that went to the university. And it's, it was a foreign concept, totally a foreign concept. And then I became also a political activist at the University of the Western Cape. That that time was designed only for black scholars. We couldn't go to any other university, but thank the Lord that I went there because it prepared me for the new South Africa. But into we had also school systems that was 11 school systems and for black children and for children like me they the schooling was different than for white uh, people so it was all that in a nutshell so it was absolutely a miracle that i was asked to be able to facilitate this wonderful building that was only built for white people in the apartheid era, the Nico Milan Theater. We now the Artscape Theater, and I call it the Humanity Center. The center that facilitates people. I am not the CEO of Artscape. I'm the facilitator of stories. The reason why I'm saying this is that because we were so divided, I always say South Africa is the world in one. We have 11 languages. We have different backgrounds. We have a mammoth of faiths. We lived, I grew up next to me was the Muslim family. Behind me was Jewish family. So we don't know what it is actually. That's why I'm saying I thank where there is almighty that I grew up totally in a multi-faith, multicultural and multi-linguistic community. So that the I of me vanished. Because just a simple thing, Amarili, before I will go on. To have a simple meal, it was for us nothing to cater for everybody. Because you have a Lao family, you know a Jewish friend will pop in, so you must have kosher. There will be somehow a vegan that will pop in. There will be everybody. So you learn from a very young age that you need to accommodate somebody else. And it was very strange for us when we moved from the apartheid into the new South Africa that we realize, oh my world, we need to teach the privileged people in South Africa what it is to give of yourself. So we were more the advantage. That's why I say every single day, I can lose everything because I know I can pick myself up again. And why are we doing the work that we're doing? Because young people listen to stories. They take that narrative and they make it, them, them, it themselves. And then 
they take it and they don't know where it comes from. And we become brutal and violent and we put borders around it because what we do is that we don't have any more that personal connection with each other. We communicate with each other via so social media, via Instagram and via Twitter. And we think that that is the world, but the world is about human interaction. And the work that we are doing is to break down the walls. For me to be the first woman of color and a woman with a disability, it was a challenge for people that saw the building only as a bastion for apartheid, but also for the people that never could enter the building, didn't want it to enter the building. Because if you have been denied of a space for so many years, you are not going to enter the building. So we needed to look at how are we going to bring people together by not having the rule to exclude anybody. And I want to say this once again. We fought against exclusion. So in the process of going forward, I needed to make a conscious decision once again with the team by saying to them, we are not going to exclude white people. And it was not an easy process. But we're going to tell each other stories so that we can start on a narrative of reconciliation, a narrative of coming to understand each other's stories and not just use the word tolerance. And I want to make it clear on this forum. The word tolerance is a terrible word to me because tolerance means I am just going to listen to your story for now, but I'm not going to take that story in and change perhaps my life to accommodate you because I can only be tolerant for that moment. I the mean, I think that's fascinating, you know, the, 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 because, you know, it, and it leads to some of the questions I'm seeing in the Q&A, but also to the one that I had uh, prepared uh, to, to, to move the conversation forward. And, you know, I think, feel free to, to, to respond to one another, uh, you and Mosin, uh, as, as you're speaking. I think that um, this whole ethic of pluralism, you know, we are the Aga Khan Museum, part of the uh, AKDN, the AKTC, which as a broader institution is committed to the ethic of pluralism. And this, what you're saying about not being exclusionary and not, um, and, and listening to voices and going beyond tolerance, I think is is actually key to being able to have that sort of conversation. So my you know my question uh, to you both to, to talk about and perhaps I can in, invite you, um, Mosin, uh, at this point to uh, to comment is about process, which you raised uh, just just now, uh, Marlene, and process. I mean, how do you get people around the table? You're working with people who are quite different. Marlene, you've just described different communities and histories of people that have, you, you've had to bring together into the same space. So how, how do you do that? And you know, do you have examples uh, and stories you can tell us um, about your experiences? Yes, tell yes. Me that. I, I think Mushin and I, we also have our stories, but I think I, I also want to say is that you can't take yourself too serious also in processes like this. You also need to laugh because there will be totally laughing situations. <laughs> and um, for me, it was first to have a listening campaign and to tell everybody that this is your space, but also stories that's never been told. I brought in into a space. So discover Islam, for instance, 
I needed to have the Muslim community to come and tell their stories and young people reading poetry out of the Qur the, the Quran was a very successful program. 4,000 kids comes through our doors that's never been there. So immediately you get a different community because the children are on stage and you also have a diverse audience. The same with the school's arts festival. And every night for three weeks, we will put all schools on stage. It's a festival, so it's not a competition. So every night you have 13 schools from rural, from the black townships, from the colored, from all 11 languages is on stage. You come and do your thing, but you get a diverse audience. And you, first of all, because I'm disabled, the only nepotism that I practiced when I got in there in that space was persons with disability gets priority. So every night there's a school that caters for a persons with disabilities or a poet or so every night parents are then confronted to see that but children with disabilities also matter. So I take, took it to the furthest end. Then we also have a humanity festival where we looked at and there people screamed at me. I said, okay, and now it's everybody that screamed then. Not, then it's not the color issue. Then I brought in the totally the LGBTQI community to have a production. So then people were homophobic. Then I said, but it's everybody's human right to exercise the human rights. If you had your human rights on stage, it's not other persons, but so that we can do it together. So what I want to say to you is that you can't just practice, practice human rights in the arts, only one-sided. You will get confronted by people by saying, Oh, it's not my view, but the arts must, can be arts for the sake of the arts, but it must also make you uncomfortable. Lastly, on this, before Musin comes in, I want to share this story because it's a laughing story. When I came in, I developed a program which we call the final dress rehearsals for the elderly people, because most of our people never visited this building. So I target the elderly homes and people that never came to the theater. So I had a bus because we don't have public transport infrastructure. So I, I always say I sleep with everybody. So with a bus company for funders, I have buses bring people in. So everybody put up the nicest dress, black colored Indian. And I went to the, to the white community also to come. So what happens actually is that everybody gets a free ticket. Everybody. I fundraise for it because I want the interaction. Everybody who's black stand in the corner. The whites will, who owns the building will be all over. And I stand there. And then the usher brought a beautiful lady with a hat. Beautiful. I will never forget this. She's looking for me because my surname is French. I'm not French at all. I can't even speak French. It's because of the slave history. You get the name of the, the slave, the head of the slave. So Le Roux is a slave name for me, a surname. So she was looking for Le Roux. Here I come. She said she realized, I realized this lady is 70 and plus. I'm not going to change her. She's now looking for Ms. LaRue. They bring her to me as the CEO, the facilitator. She decided this is not the CEO. I decided there I am not going to be the CEO because I want this to happen. I said to her, I will tell what is a problem. She said to me, I am not going to sit next to them. So I asked her, who is she referring to them? She showed me, and she used a terrible word for black people. I said to her, 
So what I do, I mix the tickets. No groups sit with each other. They must mix before the ballet goes up. I said to her, you know, you're also getting a ticket of a thousand rand for free. Until interval, you can sit together. Interval, I will tell Miss LaRue to come and fetch you so that your group can sit together. Fine. I asked the ballet master to start the ballet late so that everybody can have interaction. The ballet start. The first thing now, when the ballet started, the usher came running out to me. I thought, what the hell now again? The other community in apartheid, we could never go out to eat in a restaurant. The elderly. They brought their chicken and their sandwiches for the outing. So out comes the chicken, out comes the eggs when the curtain went up. So the entire opera house smells of chicken. I said, let everybody just be. It is, we must now let people feel comfortable. Forget about the elitist practices now. Today is about making people feel they are human beings. So interval, I went in. Went straight to the lady. She asked me not even, where's Miss LaRue? She was talking to her black friends. She didn't want to change her ticket because they were talking about how their children are not visiting them in the elderly homes. They were talking about stories which they have in common and they forgot about their color. The reason why I'm telling you this, if that day I had an ego, this experience I wouldn't have been able to tell you. Thank you. Mohsen. Yeah. I don't know how to follow up with Marlene here, man. She's an incredible uh, examples. Um, in terms of uh, just the methodology, Amarali, um, you know, well, let me take a step back because it connects to what Marlene was just saying. I think the currency of artists right now in crises and the currency of art institutions is going to be accessibility. And here's what I mean. I don't mean product. I mean process. As an artist, right now in times of crisis, how are we decentralizing our process of creation so that it can be picked up and cascaded by a 10-year-old kid in a refugee camp or a 60-year-old grandmother uh, in Mexico or a single mother in Honduras? How can we do that? I think that is a currency that artists need to think about today, as well as art institutions. Our organization, we focus on the process of communication and storytelling, not necessarily the product or the quality of the story, so to speak. We care about the process um, because the process is what involves physiology, biology, breathing, emotion regulation, uh, interpersonal sharing, peer-to-peer -peer sharing, all these things. Our methodology focuses on communications in three ways. The first is internal communication. So our whole program is founded on internal communication. What does that mean? It's understanding the stories that your brain is writing to your body without your permission. And building awareness, not fear, putting curiosity above fear for how to understand the words and stories inside of you. So an example of how we do this is uh, we have an exercise called body mapping where we say certain words and every participant has a body map and they're meditating. They then write in the body map where they feel these words that we're saying in their bodies. Knowing what we feel is the first step to knowing why we feel. Dr. Bessel van der Kolk said that, right? This is all about interoception, body awareness, which is the first type of communication in our methodology. Once they understand and build awareness 
for where they feel those words. They then realize how some words are similar across people. They realize what words have power over them. And then they can begin to reframe how they use those words internally, which can help them remodel their relationships in the world around them. So the first step is internal communication. The second is interpersonal communication. This is where the narrative therapy exercises that we've designed go to small groups where people start to share perspectives. Why is this important? Because in situations of crises and chronic stress and fear, those regions of the brain associated with empathy, cognitive empathy and perspective taking become diminished because we're in hyper survival mode, the first priority of the brain. So when you start to have a, an actual space for interpersonal sharing to happen with guided narrative therapy exercises, people begin to exercise the muscle of empathy. Not just say empathy like it's a nice fluffy word in the sky. You have to exercise empathy like going to the gym. And perspective taking is crucial for that. Marlene's story is a perfect example of that. She intervened and created an opportunity for perspective taking to happen in a physical way, right? Not just saying that it would be nice if we all empathize with each other. The third part of our methodology is community communication. And this is where every participant moves from internal, interpersonal, to then cascading their message and perspective and creativity to the community for social change, for decentralizing the power of narrative, because culture starts with the individual. And what creates culture? It's when two people have a conversation with each other. That's the basis of creating culture. You don't have to be the head of the Aga Khan Museum or the head of the Met or uh, whatever you know, cool painter is out there right now to be in charge of culture. You don't have to be a record executive. You can be a five-year-old kid having a conversation with a seven-year-old kid and you're creating culture. And we forget that. Why do we forget that? It's a human right that we're all born with. It's crucial that we have to decentralize and we have to expand these processes in this way to realize we are creators, we're not consumers. We're not victims, we're not only victims, we're not only survivors, we're also creators, right? We're meaning makers, every single one of us, no matter your education level, race, and this is your religion, right? The last thing I'll say is why our methodology is working. I'm not the one doing it. The way we work is we have a training of trainers model where we train Syrian refugees in the camp. We train Mexican mothers and survivors of domestic abuse in Mexico. We train them on how to lead their own versions of my methodology. So they go through a series of trainings and then we give them subgrants and the resources to cascade it and localize their own versions of MIWI. So it's led by the people for the people. It's not led by me. So right now we have thousands of people in the refugee camps experiencing MIWI Syria. I'm not the one doing it. It's Syrian women and men who are doing it. Right? In Miwi, Mexico, and Miwi, Honduras, we have Miwi, Texas. It's the communities leading it because we're decentralizing the process of how we work. And we're finding that that's the most effective way to have the impacts that we're having. The impacts that we're having, and then I'll stop talking, is enhanced emotion regulation. So we're noticing that communities that have been through trauma and stress and fear after our program are improving their emotion regulation skills when it comes to how they react to the disruptions in their life. Right? We're seeing that the narrative therapy exercises is improving their perspective taking because now narrative therapy is you, you have cognitive distance from you and the problem. So let's say I tell you to write a story about this tree behind me as if it's a living, breathing thing, which is an exercise in our program, by the way. You inevitably will put pieces of your lived narrative into that tree without, if I just gave you a picture of you and said, write a story, you would be less likely to do that, especially if you've never done it before. So those narrative therapy exercises improve perspective taking, which leads to improved problem solving. And one of the biggest impacts we're seeing is goal setting, which is another thing that gets diminished in crises and in situations with chronic stress and fear. This is part of our psychological pedagogy. So we have exercises called future to present, which is another narrative therapy exercise where you're literally writing a dialogue from your future self to your present self. What would you say? Where are you? How are you feeling? What's the weather like? Right? And then they move from writing it to sharing it interpersonally. So then they get perspectives. And then they video blog it to themselves and keep the video. We literally have people in different countries for years who have held on to their video on their phone and they rewatch it because it's them reauthoring and reconstructing the future and trying to bring the future one step closer to the present. That's what we need right now as artists. We need to bring the future one step closer to the present.
right? As not some intangible thing. I, I think that both of you said something really interesting um, that was, you know, very similar. Because one of the objectives of this is for you to know one another as well through the work mm -hmm. that you do. But I think that um, Marlene, you spoke about, you know, your role. You were the facilitator. You know, you're about facilitation. Mosen, you've described your work as a leader as, in the same way. As yes. I know that even within the AKDN, you know, the philosophy has always been you go and you teach a community how to do things for themselves, you know, in terms of development. So it's an interesting mm. idea to apply in the art. But I also think that it shows what um, uh, an institution like ours, uh, a museum, or in the case of Marlene, uh, uh, the Humanities Center, the, uh, the Artscape, that, that these are places that we have an obligation to then make that work public in a way that respects that work. Um, so we do have to worry about the final product and what the public sees. And not just because we're concerned about our own brand and image, but because it's a service and it's about justice to those communities. If I'm going to put up um, a work, a community work that's a, a musical performance, for example, that's done by community. I want to hire the best facilitators who can give the tools to this community to be proud of what it creates and to own it in a way that, you know, yeah, tell people about what we've just done. We want to show people what we've done. And you talked about that, you know, when you got to that place of community um, sharing, that, that to get perspective, it was important to actually share in public. Um, Marlene, were you going to say something? Yes, I want to, to say to Mosin is that that is so important is that the connection with the self. So, um, and why I think it, it, it is so important is because is that we've also developed a program where we're taking the theatre to the people because I'm, I come from the rural areas and as you said in the beginning that we, in the apartheid era, we didn't have music and arts in our school systems. It, 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 it just didn't e exist. It's the first thing if a dictator comes on board is to take it away from the people because arts are so powerful. It's a powerful tool for critical thinking, of molding, about conversation and to say what you need to say to be a, a, a humanistic viewpoint. So what we have done is that we took the theater to the people for role modeling so that we can engage with our rural communities with non-verbalization. But on stage, you'll have all our indigenous artists with the classical artists as well. So you'll have an opera singer, a violinist, you'll have an indigenous bow player, you'll have the Khoi and the San community all on one stage in order for that child. And we have thousands of kids that comes in the community and also in the evenings because we work with the police, we work with all the faith-based communities in that so that we are not the Messiah that's going out. It's a, a process. So I want to say to Musan, it's the processes of utmost importance. If, and we approach this process of a collaboration process, and we try in all our means that it is not where we go to the community and tell them this is how we want it. The process starts when we start to meet everybody in the community. But we build the stage in the most impoverished areas, Amrili and Mushin, the most impoverished area where no one has a car. People live in shacks in order for them to walk to that particular space. But the person that wants to see the ballet is also on the stage, who has a car, will drive to that impoverished area. The reason why we've done it like that so that we demystify areas which is unknown to people because we tend rather to assimilate to the wealthiest areas 
than to the poor, so that the persons in those communities can see what is happening in the poor areas and to see, but these are good people. And I want to make a change in that community as well. So I'm not saying what we're not saying, I want to be clear that if you have money, you're bad. I'm not saying that. It is how do you bring the divide together? So this program is a process with the community. It's about role modeling that we can be together. There can be one language on 11 languages on stage and music is a universal language. Dance is a universal language and we can be one. But the biggest thing for us is that the community are experienced together having a collective experience. Because if we're not creating a space of a collective experiences, then we don't have a point of having a conversation. I mean, I think that's very inspirational and more and more those spaces have to be virtual. And again, we're, we're all in the process of rebuilding in a post-COVID world.